In the world of true crime, one has to accept, on some level, that there are cases that just remain unsolved. Cases where there aren't enough clues or evidence to find the culprit, more or less convicting, said culprit. But in today's case, there is evidence, evidence in the form of the killer's voice and image captured on the smartphone of a smart girl. I'm John Dodson, and today on The Secret Sits, we are going to look into the yet unsolved case of the Delphi murders. Delphi, Indiana is a small town just north of Indianapolis, with only 3,000 residents, where big-time murders just don't happen. But on February 13, 2017, this small town was rocked by tragedy, and no one in the town would ever feel the same way ever again. Because this case is still unsolved, and the residents in this small town now have to consider if a killer is living amongst them, going to church with them on Sunday mornings, or shopping next to them at the grocery store. On Monday morning, February 13th, 2017, to be exact, and this would normally be a school day for Abigail Williams and Liberty German, but their school had a snow makeup day, and so the girls didn't have to go to school. So the girls decided to have a sleepover on Sunday night. They woke up around 10 a.m. in the home of Becky and Mike Patty. They are the grandparents of Liberty German, who we will refer to going forward as Libby. Becky and Mike had custody of Libby and her older sister Kelsey. Their biological mother, Carrie Timmons, lived about 262 miles away in Kentucky. Carrie was still very close to her girls, and she kept in close contact with them through text and social media such as Snapchat. The girl's biological father, Derek, also lived in the house with the girls and Becky and Mike. On this particular morning, the girls asked for pancakes for breakfast so Derek made the girls pancakes. After breakfast, the girls were bored. Kelsey needed to go to her boyfriend's house to help him clean out a truck he was getting ready to sell. She was then planning on staying at his house until she needed to head into work. As Kelsey is getting ready to go, Abby and Libby asked if she could take them out to the Moon on High Bridge, a local trail area in the Delphi Historic Trails area of the town. Kelsey at first said she couldn't take them because she had things to get accomplished. But after thinking about it, she decided that she had been telling her little sister no quite often recently, so she decided to take her and Abby, if they could get a ride home after they were done. Libby's father agreed to pick them up around 3 p.m., so Kelsey took the girls. Just before leaving the house, Becky told Libby to take a jacket. It was unseasonably warm, but you never know when the weather will shift. Libby looked at her grandmother and said, It's okay, Grandma, and they left the house. When Kelsey noticed that neither of the girls had a jacket or a sweatshirt, Kelsey ran back into the house and grabbed a sweatshirt for Abby and she knew that Libby had one in the back seat of her car because she always rode in Kelsey's car. Kelsey dropped the girls off at the entrance to the High Bridge Trail. She told Libby that she loved her, and she watched her little sister walk away. The Monon High Bridge is an old railway bridge, which is now dilapidated and in disrepair. It is no longer in use, and trail goers will sometimes if they are daring enough, walk over the bridge, which is over the Deer Creek. Because this was a snow makeup day, many of the school kids were planning on going out to the trails to spend their day away from school. Around 3.30 p.m., Derek, Libby and Kelsey's dad, called Becky and said that the girls were not answering his calls. He was at the trailhead where he was supposed to pick them up, but they had not shown up yet. 
several members of the family all started to call and text the girls with no answer. So the family members decided to head out to the trail to look for the girls. After all, who would assume the worst in a town as sleepy as this one? Maybe the girls lost track of time and were just running late for their pickup. The family also covered all of the ways the girls could have walked home just in case, but they found nothing. Libby's mom, Carrie, received a phone call from Kelsey, but she was at work, so she let it go to voicemail, and then she immediately texted saying she would call back when she got her break. Kelsey responded with a text that said, Call me right back. It's an emergency. So Carrie just picked up her things and clocked out and told her boss that she had to go. She called Kelsey back and she said, Have you seen Libby? To which Carrie chuckled a bit and said, No, I live 260 miles away. She then told her, Mom, we can't find Libby. Carrie immediately fell to her knees and said, What do you mean? You can't find her. Anna Williams is Abby's mom. She had her when she was just a 19-year-old baby herself. She was in the middle of her shift at work when she started receiving calls and texts about the girls being missing. At first, she was unconcerned, thinking it would resolve itself. She drove down to the sheriff's office. At this point, the phone calls go beyond the immediate family. Delphi activated their phone tree which quickly spread the information about the missing girls. And this is when they learned for the first time about some Snapchat photos that Libby had sent. By now it has become dark outside and the town is looking for the girls with flashlights. Kelsey had gone to work, but the family soon called her and she left work. Kelsey showed two photos that she had gotten from Libby's Snapchat at 2.07 p.m. Libby posted a photo of Abby walking the bridge. After this, they weren't heard from again. At this point in the search, everyone thought that possibly the girls were just lost, or possibly one was injured, but the worst had yet to be thought of. Around midnight, the official search was paused by the town sheriff, but other people continued to search. Search dogs were also being brought in from out of town. Now we all need to realize that Delphi's entire fire department and rescue operation was being conducted by volunteers, and the sheriff has to also think of them and the fact that they have jobs to get to and families at home to care for. This was part of the reason for the search pause, along with limited to no light left to search by. One thing that was now worrying Becky was that Libby was afraid of the dark, and she wouldn't be out there by choice. The next morning, due to heavy fog in the area, the search party couldn't even resume until 10 a.m. The sheriff had asked for a helicopter to assist in the search, but it too was grounded due to the heavy fog. The town set up the fire station as a command center and they had around 300 registered volunteers that showed up to help. The fire department separated all of the volunteers into groups, and the girls' family members who were there to assist were also separated from one another and placed into different search groups. Kelsey and Derek's group were sent to the high bridge. One searcher down in the creek area under the bridge yelled up to the searchers that they had found a shoe. Kelsey knew exactly what the girls had been wearing. After all, she had drove them to the trail the day before. And then the searcher down below yelled up that it was a black Nike shoe, and Kelsey immediately knew it was Libby's shoe. About 30 seconds later, another searcher down on the ground yelled that they had found the girls. What they found was not good. Both girls were found deceased. Law enforcement waited until they could tell the entire family at once, even though rumors spread quickly after the discovery. But now this search had turned into a crime scene. 
and as the sheriff made his announcement in the parking lot of the fire station, state police cars sped by on the road just behind them, headed to one of the worst scenes any of them had had the experience of encountering. Near the water of Deer Creek, less than a mile from the bridge, the girls' bodies lay. Kelsey wanted to run down to the creek to the girls, but one of the other searchers held her tight and consoled her. Most of the family members were all down at the bridge now, and they were all in disbelief that this was what was happening. One of the searchers who had found the girls talked to Mike a little bit, and Mike understood that whatever had happened to the girls had been terrible. The bodies were found on the north bank of Deer Creek. Police have not released any details on how the girls were murdered. As early as February 15, 2017, Indiana State Police began circulating a still image of an individual reportedly seen on the Moon on High Bridge Trail near where the two friends were slain. The grainy photograph appears to capture a Caucasian male hands in pockets, walking on the trail bridge, head down toward the girls. A few days later, the person in the photograph was named the prime suspect in the double homicide. The search area is huge, and it is also rough terrain. The superintendent of police reached out to the state governor, and the governor offered any resources that they needed School was in session the following day, with grief counselors on hand for anyone who needed to speak to one. The school also provided comfort dogs for the rest of the week. They really tried their best to make everyone feel okay in the face of this shocking incident. So, I want to talk now about the Moon on High Bridge. As I have said, it's old and dilapidated, and there are railroad ties missing or just rotting away. It is more than 800 feet long, and Deer Creek is around 70 feet below the bridge. Walking over the bridge is not for the faint of heart, and not everyone dares to do it. In the Snapchat photo from February 13th, Abby is looking down, and her hands are in her pockets. She is wearing jeans and a red shirt with a gray hoodie and sneakers and her hair is in a messy bun. The girls appear to have crossed over the portion of the bridge that spans the Deer Creek below, and the photo has been taken on one of the small wooden platforms that extend out of the side of the bridge. The second photo is just of the bridge as it disappears into the woods. When Libby took these photos, she uploaded them to Snapchat, which would disappear in 24 hours but some had screenshot the photos so they wouldn't lose them. These photos are the first piece in establishing a timeline. The FBI is now interviewing students at the school and establishing the timeline for this crime. The first press conference is held and the names of the victims are finally announced. And the police asked for anyone who was present in the area on the day of the disappearance to come forward with any information. They would not release any further information during this press conference. That evening, the police released two photos to the press and asked for anyone who recognizes him to contact them. The photo depicts a white male wearing blue jeans, a blue coat or jacket, and a hoodie, and he is on the bridge around the same time that Libby and Abby would have been on the bridge. He has his hands in his pockets, and his head is down. This is not a surprise, as we know you have to look down and pay attention to safely walk across the bridge. Now remember, this is a town of 3,000 residents, so recognizing one of their own shouldn't be hard. The picture being released just caused more questions, especially in the press, and some started to speculate about where the photos had come from. One of the big rumors was that there is possibly a trail camera and that maybe it had caught the entire event on film. 
After these rumors, the police finally announced that Libby's phone was found with her body and that the photos were found on her phone. And actually, it was still captured photos from a video on Libby's phone. Now this picture has been looked at a million times and everyone has their own opinion on what they think they see. His hands are in his pants pockets. No, they're in his coat pockets. He's wearing a brown hat. Or is it a hoodie? No, it's just his hair. We are going to post this photo and video of this man on our social media. Please take a look at it and tell us what you think you see. And one more thing to consider is that we also know what he sounds like, the cadence of his voice. Remember that this was a video with audio. Now the police still will not release the entirety of the audio recording, but on February 22nd, they released this man saying three words, down the hill. And we're going to play those words for you now. It is not the best audio, and it goes by very fast. So we're going to loop it a couple of times so you can get a good listen. It was at this news conference that officials credited the source of the audio and imagery to Liberty German's smartphone and further regarded her as a hero for having had the uncanny foresight and fortitude to record the exchange in secret. Police indicated that additional evidence from the phone had been secured, but they did not release it so as not to compromise any future trial. By this time, the reward offered in this case was set at $41,000. On July 17th, officers distributed a composite sketch of someone who, at the time of the investigation, was sought as a person of prime interest in the murders. It had apparently been drawn by police from eyewitnesses to a certain hiker of the Delphi Historic Trails on the day the girls had vanished and we will post these sketches on our social media as well. Now, police are indicating that the person in the sketches and the voice on the recording is not necessarily the killer in this case. They also indicate that there could be more than one perpetrator. But the police and the prosecution is still not releasing any new information about the killings or the crime scene except to say that it was a very unusual crime scene with more physical evidence than one may think, but also not the type of evidence one may assume would be present. They also indicated that there could be the possibility of one or more signatures that could be reference to the killer. And they are hoping that if this person kills again, he will once again leave these signatures so they can link the cases. On April 19th, 2019, Indiana State Police announced a new direction in the case. On behalf of the State Police and the Multi-Agency Task Force, the Superintendent Doug Carter released more materials a few days later in a press conference held on April 22nd. The new materials included a short video recording in which the blue-jeaned and jacketed suspect is seen walking along the trail bridge for a little over a second. Superintendent Carter states that because of the deteriorated condition of the bridge, the suspect is not walking naturally due to the spacing between the ties. An updated sketch of the suspect was also unveiled, as well as an extended version of the audio recording in which a slight rise in the suspect's voice can be detected as he utters the words, guys, before the phrase, down the hill. We are going to play this new audio, which also sounds a bit clearer than the original released audio. So now this clip has one word added to it. So now he is saying, guys, 
down the hill. It is unclear why the police wanted to add just this one word to what had been previously released. It was further explained that the previously released sketch, showing an older man with goatee and cap, is now considered secondary. By contrast, the clean-shaven individual of the newly revised composite is the primary sketch of the prime suspect. Police say this person may range from age 18 to 40, but caution that his youthful appearance could make him look younger than his true age. On April 22, 2019, law enforcement reached out to the public urging all to look at the sketch, listen to the audio, watch how the man walks on the bridge, and send tips to this email. Abby and Libby Tip at C-A-C-O-S-H-R-F dot com. And I'm going to spell that email out for you, but we will also include it on our social media posts for this case. The full spelling of this email is A-B-B-Y-A-N-D-L-I-B-B-Y-T-I-P at, or ampersand, C-A-C-O-S-H-R-F dot com. Investigators revealed they have reason to believe that the suspect may well be hiding in plain sight, and that the person is almost certainly familiar with the area of Delphi, whether it be from living or working there, or for another reason. An additional plea was made for help in identifying the driver of a vehicle left abandoned off of the Hoosier Heartland Highway in Delphi at the former Child Services office between noon and 5 p.m. on the day of the murders. I'm going to play Superintendent Doug Carter's press conference update on this case so that you can hear his passion and desperation for yourself. Information is being released today is the result of literally thousands and thousands of hours of extraordinary investigative efforts by Delphi, Carroll County, the FBI, the Indiana State Police, and countless other agencies. This community surrounded us some 26 months ago, and you did everything you could to support us, but most importantly, you surrounded the family of these two little girls. Gosh, I'll never forget it. After you hear what we're going to release today, I'm going to ask for your continued support, your continued understanding, your empathy and compassion um, as, as we move forward uh, to find out who did this, and we will. We're seeking the public's help to identify the driver of a vehicle that was parked at the old CPS DCS welfare building in the city of Delphi that was abandoned on the east side of County Road 300 North next to the Hoosier Heartland Highway between the hours of noon to five on February 14th, 2017. If you were parked there or know who was parked there, please contact the officers at the command post at the Delphi City Building. We are releasing additional portions of the audio recording from that day. Please keep in mind, the person talking is one person and is the person on the bridge with the girls. This is not two different people speaking. Please listen to it very, very carefully. We are also releasing video recovered from Libby's phone. This video has never before been previously released. The video shows a suspect walking on the bridge. When you see the video, watch the, watch the person's mannerisms as they walk. Watch the mannerisms as he walks. Do you recognize the mannerisms as being someone that you might know? Remember, he is walking on the former railroad bridge 
Because of the deteriorated condition of the bridge, the suspect is not walking naturally due to the spacing between the ties. During the course of this investigation, we have concluded the first sketch released will become secondary as of today. The result of the new information and intelligence over time leads us to believe the sketch, which you will see shortly, is the person responsible for the murders of these two little girls. We also believe this person is from Delphi, currently or has previously lived here, visits Delphi on a regular basis, or works here. We believe this person is currently between the age range of 18 and 40, but might appear younger than his true age. Dir directly to the killer, who may be in this room. We believe you are hiding in plain sight. For more than two years, you never thought we would shift gears to a different investigative strategy, but we have. We likely have interviewed you or someone close to you. We know that this is about power to you. And you want to know what we know. And one day, you will. A question to you. What will those closest to you think of when they find out that you brutally murdered two little girls? Two children. Only a coward would do such a thing. We are confident that you have told someone what you have done. Or at the very least, they know because of how different you are since the murders. We try so hard to understand how a person could do something like this to two, ch to two children. I recently watched a movie called The Shack. And there's also a book that talks so well about evil, about death, and about eternity to the murderer. I believe you have just a little bit of a conscience left. And I can assure you that how you left them in that woods is not, it's not what they're experiencing today. To the family. I hope that you all will give them some time because we're going to be asking that there's no media inquiry or no media response for at least the next two weeks, and I hope you understand why. The family found out about this, about this information this morning. I just want the family to know that when I take my last breath on this earth, I'll be thinking of them. There's going to be a tremendous amount of questions. I know that. I know that. Uh, never in my career have I stood in front of something like this. Please be, be patient with us. Please. Uh, we're just beginning. We are, we are just now beginning. And I can tell you on behalf of the sheriff and the police chief, so many other partners um, that have stood with us over this period of time, that we will not Stop. Doug Carter immediately walks off. No questions. Mic drop. And next to the podium where he was standing, there's a large easel 
draped in a red sheet. It had been there nearly two hours before the presser started, and what's on that easel isn't exactly clear. But it seems important. I just unveiled the person that we believe responsible for the murder of these two little girls. So I invite media to take a look at that now. I'm going to go through a few of the persons of interest in this case. Let me be very clear. None of these individuals have been charged nor arrested in conjunction with this case. On July 23, 2019, Paul Etter was wanted for the kidnapping and rape of a 26-year-old woman. On June 22, in Tippecanoe County, five days later, Etter was surrounded by police and after a five-hour standoff, he died by suicide. Daniel J. Nations, a registered sex offender from Indiana, was arrested in Woodland Park, Colorado, in September of 2017, and charged with threatening strangers on a monument trail with a hatchet. The expired Indiana plates on the car Nations was driving was noticed by police, who subsequently discovered an outstanding warrant under his name. Fanning public speculation still further, it was reported that a bicyclist had been fatally shot on the same trail at around the same time that nations had purportedly been terrifying passers-by. An El Paso County Sheriff's spokesman told reporters that however many similarities there were between the cases, he was not at liberty to disclose them since the Indiana investigators did not want any more information released. On January 5, 2018, Nations was sentenced to three years of probation for threatening members of the public in Colorado. However, he was not released since he had an active warrant out on him back in Indiana. On January 24, Nations was transferred to Indiana officials' custody on an unrelated charge, failure to register as a sex offender. In early February of 2018, authorities said that Nations was no longer considered an active person of interest in the Delphi murders. Thomas Bruce, who formerly worked as a pastor, is charged with fatally shooting one woman and sexually assaulting two others, after having ordered them at gunpoint into the back room of a suburban St. Louis shop for religious supplies. Committed in broad daylight on November 19, 2018, these crimes put Bruce in the spotlight of the press. Some noted his being of similar stature, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 9 inches, to the then current suspect and the description of the Delphi slayings. Also, his wearing a flat cap and navy blue jacket during this attack not unlike the suspect in the Delphi case. Indiana State Police did look into his possible connection in November. On December 4th, Bruce was charged with no fewer than 17 felony counts related to the St. Louis case and could receive the death penalty. Charles Eldridge was arrested on January 8, 2019, in Union City, Indiana, on charges of child molestation and child solicitation. Police in Randolph County alerted the FBI to a potential link between Eldridge and the Delphi murders on account of his strong resemblance to the suspect's sketch. This was, however, before the updated composite had been released. In response to a request from German's mother, countless homeowners across central Indiana have had orange lights installed on their front porches, both to commemorate the girls, as well as to indicate that the murderer remains at large. In August 2017, the families announced their plans to build a sports complex for Delphi in the memory of the girls. A nonprofit organization, L&A Park Foundation, was formed to celebrate and commemorate the lives of Liberty German and Abby Williams by creating a place for the appreciation of nature, art, play, and athleticism for generations to come. A site was procured a mile north of Delphi 
and in the years following the girl's deaths, continued progress has been made in the development of the Abbey and Libby Memorial Park. In 2020, the L&A Park Foundation was named a recipient of the NBA All-Star 2021 Legacy Grant. Now, four years after the murders of Abby and Libby, we have found out some new information. The police did recover a partial or smudged fingerprint from the scene. There was also additional DNA collected, which did not belong to Abby or Libby. But they have not found a match. They continue to hold all of their information close to the vest, including the cause of death of both girls. Every true crime enthusiast has that one unsolved case that irks them. It's the one case they can't stop thinking about. The one case they know could be solved if someone just spoke up. And this case, the Delphi murders, the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, is that case for me. So please, go to our social media and look at these sketches and look at this blurry, pixelated photo. And if you recognize this man, call the authorities. It doesn't matter if he is your brother, father, uncle, or just someone you recognize from high school. This person is possibly the murderer of two innocent little girls and they need to be brought to justice. And with that, I will ask you a question. What is your unsolved case that you can't stop thinking about? Email me your unsolved case to the Secret Sits Podcast at gmail.com. I'm John Dodson, and this has been The Secret Sits. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original artwork provided by Tony Lay.